Hi, I'm Malika Bilal, and you're in the stream. Today, Rodrigo Duterte, wild card, punisher, man of the people. That's how the Philippines president-elect is known. So what does that mean for the country and for the region? Our digital producer, Omar Badar, is here, and he's trying to answer that question with people online. That's the great right. thing about it is that people online are tuned in, even though it is very early in the Philippines. That's right. And you know, when you're dealing with a figure that is this controversial, undoubtedly the community is just, we have so many comments that are coming that are for and against that are really, really passionate ones. And kind of you have the perfect storm here. You have mm -hmm. the fact that we haven't done a show in the Philippines in such a long time. Very long time. Yep, and we're dealing with a figure that is this controversial. And most importantly, we love the shows that are community pitched. Mm -hmm. And this is certainly one of them. You can take a look here at my screen. We got this comment from Ahmadzar on Facebook, who says, if media is ignoring Duterte, let's make foreign media notice him. One such platform is Al Jazeera's The Stream that gives a voice to the voiceless. We really appreciate the compliments and hope that we're living up to that. In the meantime, you can join this conversation by tweeting us using the hashtag AJStream. My name is Lily Kang. I am a student at University of Notre Dame, and I'm in a stream. If a politician is going to make the leap from city mayor to president of the Philippines, they have to give people something to talk about. Rodrigo Duterte is a master at that. <laughs> And that is relatively tame. Critics have called him a womanizer. He's made rape jokes and even used profanity to describe Pope Francis. As Davao City Mayor, he earned the nickname The Punisher for his zero tolerance for crime. As president, he's pledged to bring back the death penalty. Stop it or I'll kill you. So how did the Philippines get here? With us to discuss in Manila, Aries Arugay is a political science professor at the University of the Philippines. Pompey Lavinia is the social media director for Duterte 2016, the winning presidential campaign. Carlos Saldran is an LGBT activist, and Ronnie Holmes is a political scientist and president of the Manila-based public opinion polling group Pulse Asia. Welcome to the stream, gentlemen. Aries, I want to start with you. How would you describe the appeal of Rodrigo Duterte? Uh, Rodrigo Duterte is not your typical politician. He did not does not come from the Manila-centric political elite. He is the first president to come from Mindanao, and that's something very symbolic and something that Filipinos have uh, really uh, considered when they voted for Duterte. He um, comes from Mindanao. Mindanao is often seen as resource rich, but that's where a lot of poverty and inequality and conflict comes from. So Duterte is coming off really as something relatively fresh. He is abrasive, as at the same time raw. But we've had our share of very polished, very articulate, very intelligent politicians, and it hasn't gotten us anywhere so mm. far. Carlos, is that how you would describe it? I know you have family in Mindanao. Uh, I, would, I would agree with everything that he says completely and absolutely. But it's also his kind of unpredictability, his abrasiveness that kind of creates attention. Uh, not not attention as in giving attention, but sort of like it creates some sort of discord, I guess, with international communities that don't quite understand where he's coming from and where he's going to. Abrasiveness, like what? Give us an example. Uh, like the jokes, rape jokes, um, his, his use of uh, bayot, which means uh, homosexual in pejorative manners. Um, just basically talking a bit off the cuff, which people like in the Philippines find refreshing, but I don't know how that would translate in the international community. It's already gotten him into trouble with the Australia and the United States. I just wish it doesn't keep continuing throughout his entire term. So we do have people online who are commenting about, her person about his personality and how he comes off. We have Jajan Pressing over here who says he comes off humanitarian, but, but not humane. Does that make sense? A man we might recognize as our uncle, friends, peers, and so on. And then, Pompey, you tweeted this as well. You said the mayor of the Philippines plans to use his personal pickup truck as his official presidential vehicle. And the question of this, him coming across as an ordinary person, is this just an act to appeal to people, or do you think that this is ge something genuine that we're seeing right now? Well, what you see is what you get. That is really Rodrigo Roa Duterte himself. 
that's the truck he's been he's driven ever since he became mayor and he's had total of six terms that's 18 years he has always driven a pickup truck it's not a prop that was put on there for the purpose of the elections what you see is what you get Ronnie, it, you hear him, what you see is what you get. He talked about him driving the mm -hmm. same car uh, when he was mayor. So when he was mayor, there are lots of accolades uh, that are awarded to him. Do you think that that is mm -hmm. something that can then translate? And is that the reason for part of his appeal? I think that's the reason for his appeal, really, that he has not in any way pretended to be anyone else. Uh, during his uh, declaration for his candidacy when he came out, it was, uh, he admitted that he was, uh, he had several women. He also said that um, he will kill all criminals, uh, whether that's blaster. That was something that really appealed to a significant segment of the population. So you have a candidate, when he was a candidate, he basically took out all po possible criticisms against him. And uh, despite, let's say, the cursing of the Pope in our own poll, we saw only a slight decline. And after he made the controversial rape joke, while there were a number of people who were repelled by the rape joke, many of his supporters did not withdraw their support. I think it's for the reason that he really just simply presented himself for who he is. In his own words, <coughs> he's a person, he's a man of many flaws and contradictions. You know, Ronnie, when you said that, that the appeal didn't necessarily drop with the rape comments, uh, uh, Carlos's mm. face, his eyes got wide. Yeah. He shook his head. Carlos, what were you feeling? Um, well, although he may seem like a very simple man, there's also things that are in disgust that this man is also part of a dynasty. His parents were also politicians in Davao, generations of politicians. He's from a family. Um, and... Uh, the, the simplicity has come across, but we've had a president who was like that before, uh, Eric Estrada, who seemed very populist, was very had the same sort of simple man appeal. Um, let's just see how long that, that how long this appeal can last, uh, mm. considering like what he will be achieving in the next six years. So yeah. we do uh, we do have some people online who are away. commenting. Here's the thing: we have some people mm. online who don't think that it's all personality; that it could also partially be his track record. We have. Uh, nope, not Becky, who comments in saying he turned the killing fields of Asia, Davao, where he was mayor, into one of the most livable cities in the Philippines. And then we have Raven over here who says he had done it when he was the mayor of my city. He will do it for the entire nation. We believe in him, and that's what's important. Aries, do you think that this is where the support essentially comes from, that it was really a track record that people can point to, or is it more than that? The, the track record speaks uh, and resonates very loudly. And this is very important if you have previous administrations that have been unresponsive to people's needs, that have not really lived the lives of ordinary Filipinos who line up in, on the trains every day, who experience insecurity in their communities, who know someone who have been victims of illegal drugs. These are pressing issues that have um, previous governments, have they, they've been deaf and, and, and blind to these issues. So... The problem here is, is that you have Duterte becoming a lightning rod to all these discontent and dissatisfaction. And the problem really is that you, we have weak parties in the Philippines. So even if he's part of a local dynasty, the main difference with Duterte is that that has not transformed into a national political dynasty as we have seen with Estrada and the other politicians mm -hmm. until now. You mentioned the resonating with people. Pompey, I, I want to show our audience a little something about how that resonated, um, at least how it looked online. This is just one of the many Facebook pages mm -hmm. in support of the president-elect. This one has uh, more than 200,000 members of it. Rodrigo Duterte for president. Here's another one. Uh, change starts now is a hashtag for that. And these are unofficial pages that people use. They just kind of popped up during the campaign. This last one has a, a quote from Duterte. I don't care if I burn in hell for as long as the people I serve live in paradise. So you see that, and then I want to show you one more thing and how this translated. You see the reach that the social media campaigns of the Duterte campaign had. 21 million people is what his, his, his videos on Facebook reached. And I know that part of that was an effort of, of you, Pompey. What was it that made you join the campaign? What did you see that spoke to you? 
Well, um, basically the same reason why Filipinos chose him. Uh, it was the right man with the right issues at the right time. You had a man that was incorruptible, in my view, um, with legendary courage and political will, totally disinterested in personal wealth and patriotic. And the issues of the day that he carried were crime, corruption, and drugs, which were the most important issues. Now, Professor Holmes will tell you that these were actually number two and number four and number seven on their own survey on what issues were important to Filipino voters this time. Yeah. But the difference was he was the only one who was really addressing and he owned these issues and he could, he could address these issues authentically because of a track record. So I think, combining I think, I that, think that together, you know, you had um, at the right time because as Aris had mentioned earlier, um, people were frustrated that the growth that is you know, they're really there, it's true, but it's not, it's not being inclusive enough and mm. people are waiting in trains for hours mm. and the airport faucets don't work just, no, no. and all the frustration, just correct timing. I just don't know how the MRT, which is a, a Manila issue, became such a national issue. The thing that we have to think about here is perception and perception can be manipulated. Although it may seem like it's 100% support in Davao, um, as somebody said once online, well, dead people in Davao can't talk. So who's going to be there to criticize his human rights record? Um, so really, I mean, a lot of it has to do with really the perception, because anybody who speaks up about Duterte in Davao will get bullied. And as people can experience online during the last election, although maybe 21 million strong, it actually set a precedent that bullying and toxicity can win you an election. And I don't know yeah. how that's going to translate in the future. I would not like to see an election again this toxic online. Mm. Ronnie. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah but I, I, think, I think it's really the message that was delivered. It's yeah, really but, you know, Carlos, when, when Carlos speaks as if it's a... Uh, Pompey. Let Ronnie if I, talk. If I may, uh, if I may, in, in terms of issues, I don't think it, that the criminality itself is yeah, yeah, yeah. mostly that concern. Uh, it's really jobs, it's more economic, but in, in so far as the record, what is perceived to be the record, at least of Mayor Duterte, um, that was the one that carried him through. You do have a public who, um, one of the personal concerns is really personal safety, and you have uh, a campaign that has really stuck a chord in so far as a public. Uh, it's a cross section of the public that perceives that this is a candidate that could really resolutely address this particular problem. But it's not the most urgent problem. That's why later on, I think the Duterte campaign even moved from just criminality to talk about uh, compassion, talk about the reduction of poverty and inclusive development. Towards the end, it was talking about ending labor contractualization. Mm -hmm. So you, you, so you started, it, it started off, it started off really on criminality and then took on other issues that it knew would resonate more with other classes, uh, not necessarily the classes that are so much concerned with personal safety. So, Ronnie, you mentioned how it grew, and, and I want to give you a chance to respond to this, Pompey, but I want to show our audience mm -hmm. what that actually looked like in terms of votes. You can see here, this is from GMA News Online, one of the biggest news sources in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. uh, th more than 15 million votes uh, Duterte got. Uh, his next closest yeah. challenger was uh, Mon Rojas, and you see 9.7 million. So yeah. there is a gap there. Ma uh, yeah, uh, Monica, that's... Go ahead. Monica, that's about 38%, more than 38% for the third day. That's an, the unofficial count. And uh, Secretary Rojas is second with about 23%. Mm -hmm. It's pretty close to what his pre-election figures were. Uh, if I remember, in our last survey, it was about 35%. And Secretary Rojas and Senator Poe were more or less tied at about 24%, 24 and 22%. So it grew uh, towards the latter part, and largely because of a shift in terms of probably the preferences of other people coming from other candidates for that matter. So, Roddy, as but you're talking, Ro Ro uh, 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 Carlos is trying to get in, but I know Pompey has been waiting, and our community, of course, has something to say. So, Pompey, go ahead. Yeah, well, um, basically, basically, we did try to address the issue of poverty and, and wages and inflation, but we did not own those issues because all the other candidates we're addressing it. But I'd just like to point out, based on Carlos's comment, really there was a, in a way, this was a 
a measurement of patients. If you listen to Carlos, you, he seems to think that the MRT is not such a big deal. But really, to many, many Filipinos, especially in Metro Manila, it's such a big thing to have to wait for hours in the heat of the sun in something that should be working, you know, on the dot. And that misperception on the other candidates' side of the frustration of the people, you know, resulted in the victory to Mayor Duterte. Yeah, so I know, Carlos, that you want to respond to that, but I just want to throw this at you because there is a similar sentiment that is being echoed online. Jonathan says, just based on my Facebook feed, thought a lot of people also voted for him because they hated the Liberal Party for its inadequacies. Do you think that there is blame to basically place on the opposition to Duterte for not being better candidates? Oh, no. I blame the opposition for not taking social media seriously and seeing how issues like the MRT can be blown completely out of proportion. And the MRT, of course, um, for our international audience, is the railway system that uh, runs through Manila, a railway Manila system, and every which other part. It's which has been mismanaged for more than 20 years. It's been focused upon being a problem of the last administration, when it's actually been a problem of the last four administrations, being run by a person who has been uh, accused of corruption, um, the MRT Holdings Company, the private partner of the, public, of the government. So I think really what the opposition's problem was is that they did not, is that they underestimated uh, social media. Good, because as I said also, aside from being perception, Although the popularity may seem huge, remember that this is a multi-candidate election. This is not between two people. So although Duterte may seem like he has a majority, 38%, 62% of the Philippines still did not vote for him. And that creates quite a challenge in the next six years, mm. how to bring the yeah, other 62% on board with but, him. But, well, well um, no president has ever um, gotten a majority exactly. in, the Philippine, uh, in, in Philippine presidential politics. And this is part of the electoral system of the country. And um, however, I think the reason is, is that when, when the Constitution was being framed, a lot of the political elites don't like a president that would have a majority because he would be very powerful. In Philippine politics, we often describe it as an anarchy of families. So if you have a politician that's able to get a majority of the vote, that would pretty much neutralize mm. the fiefdoms um, um, being held Maybe, by all these political yeah. families. Fiefdoms. Well, I hadn't or, heard it. I hadn't heard it uh, described like that. The, you know, there's something that Carlos said a little bit earlier uh, about right opposing voices, and I'm actually glad you you said that because this is where I want to segue. Um, you mentioned the need to bridge these sides together, the, the sides of those who did vote for Duterte and those who didn't, and people who didn't take social media seriously enough. So I pulled up on my screen here something that you sent us, Carlos. Um, this is some of the dangers that you face. You've gotten death threats. This is one of the tamer ones uh, that someone sent you on Facebook who want you to bash your brains in on the pavement. Later apologize for these comments um, after, of course, you posted them and, you know, you, you uh, highlighted them. What can you tell us about the atmosphere and then how we're going to move forward? Well, um, uh, just like any other advertising campaign or marketing of soap, shampoo and any other product, one can take market studies of particular segments all around the Philippines and see what they can do to increase popularity here, decrease popularity there. And I think the bullying was part of the decreasing of popularity. The sending out of disinformation about the opposing candidates. You have 12 million people on the Duterte side, so that's 12 million people sending out disinformation about Grace Poe, about Mar Rojas, and any other candidate. So there could be a good side to the social media part, but when it comes to disinformation, there's a bad part. And the bullying and the death threats, I feel, were part of the social media camp. Mm -hmm. not, well, maybe not. Only Mr. Levine can mm -hmm. tell us if that was part of the plan. Um, but it was definitely a major player in the determining of the winner of the last election. Bullying people mm -hmm. into silence. I mean, somebody joked once that back during martial law, people tried to kill you in real life during an election. Now they just try to kill your voice online. Mm -hmm. So we have people who are commenting also on the fact that he's going to be a strong man and what, what the implications of that are. We have Pete mm. who tweeted in saying, if his record in Davao as mayor is anything to go by, expect state-sponsored brutality. There is a reason why Davao is the safest city in the Philippines. And we have Neslihan who asks, who says, fighting crime may be great, but how about fixing the problems which might make people turn, uh, turn people to crime as a way of life in the first place? Uh, Ronnie, mm. let me toss this to you. Do you think that the strongman approach might actually lead to safety 
but does not really resolve the underlying frustrations that might be existing in the country that um, lead to that yeah, kind of I, outcome. I, I would agree with that, Omar. Yeah, um, you know, strongman approach, um, it can work probably in an area, in a city, but not, in a, not at the national level. Uh, let's say, for example, there was a statement recently, I don't know whether it came from uh, presumptive President Duterte himself or whether it came from his camp, that they were willing to arm uh, community members. Uh, in the first place, that's unconstitutional. I don't think law enforcement agencies can just simply delegate such authority to civilians. And there are constraints uh, in terms of taking that action. So if there are legal constraints, I don't think that they can really solve criminality in the span of time that it was promised during the campaign. Uh, there are punitive measures that you can take, but I think a holistic measure. It's been mentioned several times, for example, if you want to solve the illegal drugs, it's not going to be productive if you just simply focus on capturing all criminals. There are many factors that lead, lead to the proliferation of drug use, and a number of those factors are neglected in this particular approach. Pompey, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, well, let me respond to Carlos first because there seems to be there some denial of reality. You know, social media does not create reality. It only reflects what's there out there. The frustration of the people, the anger of the people, the trains not working, you know, and after six years, they had six years to fix it. The airport's not working. Those were real. And the frustration of people were real. It's not that they had a weaker social media campaign. I mean, if you put me in charge of Carlos's candidate's social media campaign, I wouldn't know, I couldn't figure out how to make him win even if, may, if I made it seriously, because I couldn't change reality. Now, on the issue of fiefdoms, well, I think it's the other candidates in the last election that were, you know, run by the big families and financed by the big families. You know, Duterte's campaign was really grassroots and volunteer-driven. So I don't know where that, that comment about fiefdoms came from. Now, as far as the bullying, okay, you have to remember, it's actually 14 million, not 12 million. We have 14 million followers on Facebook. Now, how many people bashed Mr. Saldran? I mean, you know, you can't say that 14 million people bashed him. And he's got to admit also, he called the supporters of Duterte Dutertards, you know, which is like, what, basically saying they're retards. And these are... Mm. You know, now you know there's, what, how many million, 16 million retards in the Philippines because they just happen to like this man and the issues that he stood for. Well, you I, know, I want to little... pause you there, Carlos. Um, I it's a I, Pompey, excuse me. I, I want to pause you there you just because you, you, you brought up something that I want to pivot to. We'll get into more in the post show. But you said the issues that he stands for. And that's what we haven't talked about. Um, Aries, mm. one of the things that, of the policies that he has said that he's going to put forward are things yes. like a curfew, 10 p.m. for kids, uh, things like curbing drinking, smoking. In about two sentences, because we're running out of time, do you think that there is room for that in the Philippines? Well, uh, he is still uh, behaving like a uh, city mayor. Uh, however, mm -hmm. having said this, I think in the Philippines, we, we tend to see things needed to be changed in big strides. And I think it's very uh, proper to think about that maybe change could start really on small things. And then we scale up and we build on this. So I'm not totally uh, denying that these are trivial things. Mm -hmm. And the president needs to dream big. We have presidents who dreamed big, but it, we, they, they all fell flat on their faces. So maybe these little things can work, mm -hmm. and then we try to incrementally do the big changes. All because right. we've done the reverse, and it hasn't gotten us anywhere. Aries, we will see. Aries, Pompey, Carlos, and Ronnie. We're going to pause the conversation there. I want to get the last word from our community. Sure, we have Keiko who says, I'm not confident enough he'll be a good president, but I hope he will. Let's give the man a chance. Give the man a chance. We will see. We're out of time in the main show, but stick with us online. Stream.aljazeera.com. See you there.
Welcome back. If you're watching this, you're online with our post show talking about the Philippines controversial president elect Rodrigo Duterte. We're going right, to get right back to that discussion. We were talking about some of the issues, the policies that he has put forth. Uh, he's not yet in office. He's the president elect, of course, and so we'll see if they will come to pass. One of them is one I pulled up on my laptop. This is an article just from earlier uh, today. Mm. Philippine communists welcome unofficial cabinet offer. So the president elect says he's likely to offer four positions for posts to Communist Party that could bring peace. Of course, uh, there has been fighting and uh, a history yeah. there. Uh, there's also mm -hmm. an issue with rebels in Mindanao. Uh, and that is an issue that people in our online community, of course, are talking about because we have residents who are talking to us from there. That's right. And we actually got mm -hmm. a video comment from somebody who's commenting specifically about the prospects of getting this issue resolved. It's from Nuraini. Take a listen to what she has to say. I believe in Duterte's sincerity. And I know that he will try his best to fulfill his promise of correcting the historical injustice made against the Mindanaoans. Will it be enough to achieve lasting peace? That remains to be seen. We look forward with positivity and hope during the next six years, but we have to do it together for the sake of the future generations. And with this, we hope brighter days are ahead of us. So, Carlos, setting aside all of your reservations on Duterte's domestic policies, when it comes to something like this, do you think that he has a chance of actually affecting some positive change? Oh, he has a great chance. It's what he does with it after. Because um, uh, as you put out that article there, the communists and giving them positions in the cabinet, you know, that may sound like a unifying act, but one has to remember that the communists historically have always been against the Philippine military. So this will also would create tension internally. So I wish that he, if he, uh, as he says these strong comments, that he was also tread lightly to see what kind of things will be displaced by shaking the system up so much. I mean, I believe in change, but I think change should be done slowly, gradually, and with a lot of thought. I don't know if that's the direction that Mr. Duterte is going to be taking. Ronnie, you're nodding your head there. No, I, I think in terms of issues, uh, for example, President Duterte has the biggest chance in terms of solving the Mindanao conflict. Uh, he has been in touch with the MILF. He has been in touch with the MLF. Even with regard to the communist insurgency, uh, Joe Masison is a former professor of his. Although I don't really agree with the offer of four cabinet positions to the Communist Party, I think it has also been clarified that they need not necessarily be from the Communist Party. They will look at the short list of recommendations from the Communist Party, but they might just simply appoint progressives there. Although I agree with Carlos, what we've had in the past, specifically under the government of Cory Aquino, this is after 1986, it was a cabinet that was composed of people coming from the left to the right. This is a test, going to be a test of the capability of uh, Mayor Duterte to really mediate between groups that are ideologically different or polarized. Uh, I don't know, it has not been seen uh, whether he can do it, mm -hmm. because you do have former military generals in, in his group, and you're bringing in uh, members or progressives from the left. In Korea Kino's time, there was some factionalism, there was a lot of factionalism, and it led to the resignation of a progressive labor secretary. Now Mayor Duterte is offering it to the Communist Party to identify recommendations we recommend people for that particular position. Mm -hmm. That might also repel some business groups who might think that this is something that would be uh, basically detrimental to the business sector. So how do you now mediate? Uh, we have not seen how President, uh, for example, President Duterte's capability in terms mm -hmm. of mediating between disparate groups. Right. You know, you mentioned factionalism. Pompey, I want to show you one more uh, uh, possible cause of concern. This is a tab from ABC. Rodrigo Duterte very likely to face coup if elected Philippines president. Now, he has been elected Philippines president. This is from opposition uh, politicians who are saying this. What's your forecast on how you see this playing out, Pompey? Look, I think Mayor Duterte will have a very successful presidency. I mean, I think I, I disagree with Aris that he's acting like a small town mayor. Maybe if your expectations is that he acts like the elite in Manila, but he has put forth some very broad and ambitious uh, objectives 
look, the first one, which was the cornerstone of his campaign, was to eradicate, if not, you know, really bring down the level of crime, specifically drugs and corruption in our country. Now, that is what we know. But number two, he has also put forth the proposal for federalism, which will be the first on the order of business in the new Congress. And this is really an attempt to take away power from where it's now centralized in Metro Manila and spread it out more towards the provinces. And hopefully that would result in more inclusive growth. Then you see that there is, on the monetary policies, basically he's going to keep it the same because you know if it ain't broke, don't <laughs> fix it. Except that he's open to increasing foreign ownership to 70%. Because maybe that will, they feel that this will spur the economy more. And as the economy gets bigger, there's a bigger chance that the growth will be inclusive, right? Then, of course, last but not least, there is the attempt at a comprehensive peace. Peace with the communists. You have to look at it in the context of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. It's not just the communists, but peace with the communists, peace with the moral rebellion, um, Peace, you know, throughout the land, uh, across <laughs> all factions. Peace throughout and the land is where really I'm going to pause is just this conversation, Pompey. So that in the end, there might be more food, categorical more food, more, ta more shelter, more health care, and more oh, education oh, for oh, the average oh. Filipino. This sounds like the promised land. And I've been to the Philippines, and I, I was already impressed. So uh, that is a country I would like to visit again. Thank you for that, Pompey. You sound like you're definitely across uh, the policy directives. We'll see if you end up with the cabinet position. We'll see. I want to thank our guests, Aries Arugay, Pompey Lavinia, Carlos Seldron, and Ronnie Holmes. I'll give the very last word to our community, who stayed up late, some of them, to watch this show. That's almost. right. We have a comment here from Jonathan, who says, Duterte laid out some plans. They don't seem concrete and, he, concrete, and he wasn't my choice. But all we can do now is hope that he'll prove us wrong. We'll check back in to find out. Thanks to all of our guests for joining us. Until next time, take care.